Okay. This is a general outline of the talk I'm going to give. Unfortunately, it requires a lot of uh, background material to explain what exactly I did in my experiment. Because overall, I'm explaining an experiment I did to actually try and empirically show that human intelligent agents perform better than algorithms do. Therefore, they're not algorithmic. Therefore, there's something not physical about them, as John was pointing out with his insight pro problem issue. Uh, but to explain exactly why I think my experiments show that, although they didn't quite go according to plan. Uh, I have a lot of background material to go through, and since I have limited time, I'll go really fast, and then I'll just leave everyone confused, and that'll be it. All right? Okay. So first, a quick primer on intelligent design theory. I'm not quite sure how familiar everyone is with it. Um, so here we go. Oops. Okay. So normally, intelligent design theory is characterized as God of the gaps. It's like, oh, we can't explain this, so therefore God did it. What did you do that? Is that all there is to it? I don't think so. Okay, the real question is, do we have a dependable way, like say we had a little box with a light on top of it, and you could stick an artifact or a physical object in that box, and when the light blinked on, that meant that artifact was designed. Could we create a box such that it could dependably always blink the light when a person or some other intelligent agent had created that object directly. That's the big question that intelligent design asks. Can you create this special box? So it's not accessing the metaphysical meaning or anything like that, but it's looking at the characteristics of the physical object to see if it's characterized by design. Are there empirical things that dependently um, correlate with a designing agent. So that's the basic question intelligent design asks. So it's much broader than just creation versus evolution. It applies to forensics, it applies to the SETI program, it applies to archaeology, many, many, many disciplines. It also has many world-changing implications. So pretty much it revolutionizes all of human thought. Now the fundamental claim of intelligent design as to why you can detect design is that only intelligent agents create information. Now information is a kind of ambiguous word. Different people mean different things by the term. It has many different characterizations in mathematics. So uh, this is a particular kind of information called complex specified information, which uh, Dembski described mathematically. All right, so here's one of the first core concepts of intelligent design, one most people are familiar with, irreducible complexity. It's the idea that you can have uh, organisms that have a whole bunch of complex parts that go together to create a unified functionality. And if you take away any of those parts, that functionality disappears and ceases to do anything useful, and there's no pathway to get there through incremental putting things together. You have to have it all together at once. And we software engineers are very familiar with this concept. We're quite skeptical about building big, complex systems piecemeal, just monkey patching things. We realize that there has to be a comprehensive design stage when you kind of pull everything together and make a, a fundamental architecture. So at least for us computer programmers, this is not a big thing to swallow. Okay, the other, the the other thing which goes very much in line with irreducible complexity, I'll show irreducible complexity, is a subset of the explanatory filter and uh, also complex specified information. This is the explanatory filter. So it's a theory of causality. Uh, what kind of causal agents can you uh, say cause a specific entity? And so it proceeds by first ruling out two kinds of causal agents. So that's why people often characterize ideas of God in the gaps. It rules out the two causal agents that make up physical processes, which are either deterministic agents that always have the same, you have a state A always results in state B, or you have probabilistic agents where state A has a probability distribution over being either B, C, or D. So those are the only two types of agents that all of physics is constructed from. Uh, Newtonian physics is deterministic agents, and uh, quantum physics is probabilistic agents. Uh, so first you rule out those two, oh sorry. First you rule out those two kinds of agents. But that doesn't get you to intelligent design. Just because you ruled out all known physics does not necessarily mean it's intelligently designed. So obviously that's not God of the gaps. God of the gaps says, oh, not physics, therefore God. There's a third element which one of the other speakers brought up, but it's specification. Winston also talked about it. And that is, it conforms to an independent pattern, or an independent specification, which might be a pattern. 
And Dembski further refined this concept into complex specified information. Now really complex specified information is pretty much the same as the explanatory filter, except you realize you don't really need the first step of eliminating deterministic agents because that's just a subset of probabilistic agents with a probability of one. So the complexity is just your probability of that event, a particular event happening, has to be very unlikely. And then specification is the third step, whether it conforms to the independent uh, specification. Oh yeah, one, one thing just to think about, so is a fractal complex specified information, because it looks pretty complex and it definitely has a pattern, but does that signify it was be created by an intelligent agent? I'm not gonna give you an answer, it's just a question to think about. Okay, and so to give you some concrete ideas about what it means for humans to create information, I use the concept of irreducible complexity. It doesn't encompass all of the types of information that people, you know, intelligent agents can create, but it is a definite subset because to combine all these parts together, that's a very improbable event, and they're specified by their unified uh, functionality. So it fulfills both elements of complex specified information. And uh, there are a surprising number of things that we do that are characterized by complex specified information, like orchestras, pieces of art, complex inventions, even a chair. So it's really all around us if you know what to look for. And as I explained before, this makes ID completely different than all of modern science. All of modern science proceeds by either deterministic agents or probabilistic agents. At least the hard sciences like physics and stuff like that. Biology is a bit more fuzzy, especially when you get out into ecology. But uh, modern, uh, modern science is trying to reduce everything to these two agents. So this completely subverts the paradigm rating modern science. ID says no to all of that. And uh, furthermore, so all so the way you can characterize it is all modern science focuses on the information that's created. Intelligent design takes it back a step and looks at the information creation itself. So if you wanted to place money on which branch of thought is more productive, you can either look at the outcome of our oil production or you could look at the oil wells themselves. I'd say you put your money on the production side versus the gas station, which uh, actually don't make the gas station owners any money. All right, so that's a quick intelligent design primer. Now, here's what, uh, how I'm trying to apply that. Because my real interest being a programmer and engineer type personality, I like to apply things. I tend to be skeptical about ideas unless I can actually apply them to something practical. And so I was originally very skeptical about ID until I realized I could apply it in a certain way. And so it's a little bit tricky to explain, but I'm applying it by trying to use the information created by intelligent agents, us humans, to improve algorithmic processes. So according to intelligent design theory, uh, algorithms are really handicapped. They actually can't do very much at all. I, we all think of computers as these magical things that hold the answers to all of life's questions, but that's only because we've restricted them to very particular domains where we've clearly identified uh, solutions that they're really good at following. So when you expand the domain of computers and try to have them solve lots of other problems, their ability to solve problems quickly breaks down. And we end up having to use a search process instead of a precise algorithm. And this is where you bring in people. The search process by itself, just carried out by algorithm, is not very effective. But if people can create information, as intelligent design theory implies, you can actually improve the algorithmic performance way beyond what's mathematically possible. So I have a little graphic here. Your unaided robot or algorithm. Uh, you can't find his way out of the maze, but with the help of a person, maybe you can. So. Okay, well, uh, this is also not just the idea I thought of myself. Actually, this general idea is being used by numerous people in industry to one degree or another. Mechanical Turk is basically allowing people to create very simple web jobs for uh, people to do that it's very hard for them to get computers to do, like image recognition or just uh, mining the web for information. There are captchas that allow you to distinguish between humans and uh, algorithms online. Uh, and actually the most promising one is something called Foldit. Now Foldit is a gene folding program. Originally it was a project where people just donated their CPUs to fold genes for uh, scientists. 
However, this turned out to be not very useful. Even with enormous amounts of CPU time, they still didn't achieve very many significant results. However, they found that when they let people assist the algorithms in folding the genes, they actually made tremendous leaps and bounds over what was previously accomplished. In fact, just within the space of like a couple of weeks, they managed to sequence an HIV um, DNA structure or something that had previously eluded scientists and supercomputers for decades. So this technique definitely shows promise. Okay, now I'm going to quickly explain uh, how search algorithms, what they are and how they work into solving problems and how people can integrate with them. Uh, so, as I was saying, it, we normally think of computers are really effective because we have a set of problems that we know how to solve very well with computers. And computers are very good at these problems. However, for most of the problems that we actually care about in day-to-day -day lives, they turn out to be very complex. And what I mean by complex is that as the problem size grows linearly, the time to solve the problem explodes exponentially. So for any problem of significant size, it's impossible to solve it in any reasonable time span on the computer. And here's a graph uh, demonstrating the different uh, complexities. Blue are all the problems that we can solve really well with computers. The problem size just grows linearly. I mean, the problem solving time grows linearly with the problem size. Green are polynomially growing problems. They're tricky, but we still can solve them uh, to a relatively useful degree. But red are the problems that we just are pretty much stuck with when we try and solve them with computers. As you can see, the graph just shoots up really steeply. And here are some examples of these complex kinds of problems, which I'm going to call MPC problems. Finding binding sites on proteins, planning good delivery routes, calculating cheap airline flights, uh, picking good stock market portfolios, packing your belongings for a move, and making the internet fast. Just a quick scattering of problems I thought of that fit into this domain of problems that are very hard to solve effectively with a computer. So the distinguishing characteristic between the problems that we can solve very effectively with computers and those that we cannot is whether you can incrementally find better solutions. Now the ones we can do really well with, there's a very straightforward path to finding the ultimate solution to the problem. But the ones that are hard require the algorithm to do lots of backtracking and exploration. And since you have to go back and look at other algorithms, I mean, other solutions, to find the best one, it turns into a search process. Now you can visually think of the search process in terms of a landscape. So if you think of each uh, solution as a coordinate, a 2D coordinate, and its value as an elevation, you can consider a space of possible solutions as a mountainous landscape. The solution you're looking for is going to be the highest peak on that landscape. And the rest of the solutions will be lower line hills and bumps and so on. The worst solutions are the lowest valleys. And what a search process has to do is figure out how to go from some arbitrary position in that landscape to the top of the highest peak. Now, if the landscape is flat, this is pretty straightforward. All the algorithm has to do is look at the surrounding uh, solutions and always just pick the highest one. And that will necessarily lead it to the top of the peak every time. So that's really easy to do. There are complications, however, when the landscape is bumpy. And the biggest problem is that the algorithm can get fooled by the top of a bump to think it's found the highest peak when it has not. And so then the whole problem with search algorithms is how to get them to effectively explore the landscape without getting stuck like that. And it's usually done by adding some element of stochasticity to the search process. And the whole, uh, so that's kind of a visual of what the algorithm is doing. So the dilemma that the algorithm faces is say it's found a number of different promising solutions. Uh, the most promising are unfortunately over here on a low lying hill, but that's the largest number of good solutions it's found. It's also found a scattering over the other hills, and the best one is actually far away from the ones it thinks are most uh, promising. So the dilemma that the search algorithm faces is trying to distinguish out of all these different possible solutions, which one 
signifies another good area of the land, search landscape to explore. And the interesting thing is, is that that determination process turns out to be just as hard as the original problem it was trying to solve. So uh, trying to search, effectively search the landscape turns out to not have given the benefit the algorithm at all. It's right back where it started. And so this is where our interaction can come into play. So here's an example of a set of solutions the algorithm is looking at. And brief explanation of what you're seeing here. These yellow star type things, that's how good each solution is. So one star, that's not a very good solution. Five stars, that's a really good solution. And the character, uh, I'm eliminating uh, problem context. So the characters just show uh, in a generic sense how each solution is constructed. Solutions that share the same set of characters are very similar to each other. Solutions such as um, number nine and number five are very different from all the others. They're very different solutions. Actually, all the ones five through nine are very different. So looking at all those, the algorithm has to decide which is the next best one to start its exploration process from. And as I said, that's a, actually a very difficult problem. So here's how us intelligent agents come to the rescue. Through our superior pattern recognition capabilities. All right, so in Dr. Dembski's paper, Search for a Search, and there's another paper too where he makes a similar point, uh, he makes the claim that search algorithms, when you just put an arbitrary search algorithm on an arbitrary landscape, that algorithm can't be expected to perform any better than a random search. So it performs no better than just randomly looking at solutions all over the landscape until you happen to find the best one. And the only way an algorithm can perform better than a random algorithm is by being given information about the landscape, giving some kind of direction of where to search on the landscape. Furthermore, he shows that this information cannot come from another algorithm. You cannot have a meta-algorithm that looks over all possible uh, landscapes and figures out what kind of information to give the, that other algorithm. It turns into exactly the same problem. So via infinite regress, if an algorithm ever has uh, information about the landscape, it cannot have come from another algorithm. There is some non-algorithmic source of that information. So for John's point, it must be a non-physical source. Now conversely, as I was explaining early on, earlier on in the presentation, intelligent design theory posits that intelligent agents can in fact create this information. So if that is true, then the inference is by including humans in the search process, the algorithm will outperform just a algorithm all by itself. And this is beyond any kind of benefit that you expect if, say, humans are just artificial intelligence or something. If they were just another kind of algorithm, you wouldn't expect any significant benefit. But the implication of intelligent design theory is that if humans are indeed intelligent agents for intelligent design theory, then you will see significant gains in your algorithmic search process. So another graphic showing that the algorithms don't give any information to each other. And this has been empirically demonstrated to some extent. Um, there, this is another NPC problem, actually incomplete, called traveling salesman problem. This is a very hard problem for algorithms to solve, and as the problem size increases, they, it takes, in the best algorithms, algorithms we know of at least, they require polynomial larger amounts of time as the problem size increases linearly. The surprising thing though is that humans, when they look at larger and larger problems, the time for them to solve the problem only increases linearly. So at the very least we can say that whatever is going on inside our thought processes is something superior or at least very different from what we can do now algorithmically. Now I've not reached the point yet where I can say categorically that they're doing something completely non-algorithmic, but at the very least they're doing something that the be our best and smartest computer scientists have not been able to discover. So you can see the 
graph a little closer. Now my, this is not really a rigorous uh, claim or anything like that, but just my off the cuff thought about why this might occur is because at least commonsensically, it seems we humans have a very good pattern recognition capability. Like John was pointing out, it seems similar to our ability to solve insight problems. And so I think it might be this capability we have that makes us better than computers. But that's just a thought. I don't have a rigorous way to specify that yet. All right, but to give you a concrete idea of what I'm trying to do here, I'm giving you an opportunity to try and come up with what area the algorithm should explore next. So I'll give you a little bit here. So what you're looking for is a solution that's fairly good, but it's also very unlike all the other solutions. I'm not sure what's the problem. Okay, so out of all these solutions, you're looking for one that is a fairly good solution, so not like one star, but it's also, uh, in terms of the different symbols it has, very different from all the so others. So, can you formulate what is the challenge? What, yeah. what is the target of the search? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, I cannot give you that information because the algorithm itself has no. That would be like the meaning that the doctor is talking about. You don't. So for this whole experience, experiment, neither the algorithm nor the person have access to the mean, the context of the problem. All you have is access to the representation and the valuation. So what's the meaning of the cutoff then? Uh, they're just to differentiate different parts of the solution. All it signifies is that uh, colors, solutions with different colors and symbols are different than ones that have all the same colors and symbols. So these solutions are very similar to each other because they're very much that they're very similar to each other. And the Whereas, symbols that, that what they what do they mean? Um, something arbitrary. The, it, that's, that's the whole point is that the meaning of these solutions is not important for solving the problem. So you're looking for something that's unlike the other solutions, yet still highly ranked in stars. Right. So I would say number five. Okay, so everyone say what numbers they're thinking? Five. Uh, eight. Five. So eight. seems like consensus is five. Yes, you're right. So you've just done something which uh, computers are not very good at. Now, here we go on to my experiment, which uh, I must confess is not really conclus conclusively proven my thesis. And there's definitely lots of work to do. But you can at least see where I'm going with my research. And maybe you can give me suggestions on how to make it better. So the big thing I would like to prove is that humans categorically can improve over all search algorithms. Any given search algorithm, you pair a human up with that task and you, the human at least uh, has the potential to always outperform that algorithm. Now uh, that's a very hard claim to prove and I've come nowhere near proving that or demonstrating it at all. All I've actually approached is a very reduced form of that claim, which is uh, humans can improve over some particular search algorithm on a particular domain. So we're just looking at very specific domains, and I can make this whole part. This whole experiment can really be improved upon in many ways. This is more just like an initial step. Now, how do I say the computer, the human is actually doing better than the computer? Well. The criteria for comparison is that uh, the human is, or well, the winner is the entity which is able to find a better solution in fewer number of solution evaluations. So number that's the number of solutions that entity looks at, and that means based off of less information, it's been able to infer something better. Now the actual problem, so here I'm letting you guys into a secret. The algorithm doesn't actually know any of this information. So you guys are getting an unfair event, so you're not gonna be able to play this game. But anyways, the problem that's trying to be solved, that we're trying to solve here is finding primes that generate RSA key pairs. 
Now, if you know much about cryptography and how internet security works, you know if I could solve this problem, I'd pretty much decimate the internet as we know it today. So, never, yeah. <laughs> but never fear, I, I, I have not done so. It's just, it's a well known, very hard problem, and that's why we built all internet security on this problem. And uh, I'll skip over the details for now because I'm running on time. I can explain more what I did, but the basic idea is that I used Amazon Turk service to incorporate humans into the search process. I'll show you the interface they used. You can see it's a little bit analogous to the one I showed you where you have a star rating of each uh, solution and symbolic representation. As you can also see, all the solutions are the same, so there's not much choice going on. But that's a different thing. Uh, and this explains it a bit. It's just why I said checkbox is where they select one solution, stars at the rating, symbols is uh, the solution itself. Now, here are my results. Uh, so they were pretty, fairly disappointing. Uh, they weren't a complete failure because the human was able to find one solution down here that was as good as the, the one of the best that the computer had now. Now, due to the characteristics of my problem, the best, there's a set of best solutions, there's not one best solution, and it forms a uh, volume or a uh, curve. And so all the solutions on the curve are the best found so far, and the one the human found was on that curve. So the human definitely did not outperform the search process, but the human did contribute, did to equivalent to the search process. So it's not an amazing result, but it was not a complete and absolute abysmal failure. All right, so I cannot conclude that my hypothesis has been proven. Uh, additionally, my experiment itself may not have proceeded as I thought because it is fairly well known that humans script the Amazon Turk server. So I may not have had any human participation at all. It may have all been scripts that someone wrote. So that's a big part I have to improve on. And, and as I said, there are many things that can be improved in my experiment. All right, questions? Okay, so if indeed your hypothesis is proven mm -hmm. that, man, that people you know, who work with the computers show they're smarter than computers, yeah. and working together, could there not in the future be the development of a, uh, a log? How do you call it? The rhythm, the logarithm, algorithm, algorithm. 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 It's late. Algorithm that would indeed be faster than, it would be. and therefore it cause that whole problem of God of the gaps. And mm -hmm. does it appeal, to, appeal to that. No, if I actually am successful in what I set out to do, I am comparing humans to mathematical bounds of what algorithms are capable of. So if the human does outperform the computer, it's just mathematically impossible for the algorithm to ever do any better. And this is a mathematical little fact. So that's how I avoid the whole kind of gaps. Yes? So, so my question is, I suppose in any pragmatic uh, uh, computer problem, we humans, all, in the initial formulation of, uh, of the solution, uh, software solution, we human already inject some, some knowledge. Right. And so, in other words, uh, we do not give the problem, we do not express it in a totally open space without giving any hint. Any, any program, it, it's actually a human, an intelligent uh, agent hint how to, what are the steps to find the solution. Now, in, in a specific difficult problems, you can, let's say you are not, not very well versed in, in the problem domain, mm -hmm. or the problem domain is very complex, it's a new research. You may provide with initial some hints, some inject some active information. It's for some time, uh, and, and uh, the program can can perform later. Two months later, or you read a scientific paper, you find other some other hints, or you meditate yeah, right, more, right. and you inject additional information, and, and you outperform yourself. Right. That's the trick that lots of evolutionary uh, proponents try and play with evolutionary algorithms, right? That to but but I would say that even the original program is an injection of active information. Uh, to some degree, yeah. I would say um, there's going to be a slight amount of active information injected here, but I'm hoping just for the degree of solutions attained uh, outweigh that. 
from? Yes, John. Well, um, I originally hated your your uh, your interface, but um, I I think I like it if 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 if, if you changed one thing. Okay. Um, and that is so the decontextualization is good. Um, well, that's, that's key. I yeah. Can't, actually, yeah. I can't ever give the contextual. Right. I I think I and I, yeah I think that was a, a definite positive. I think the one thing. Because because the, the question is can can the human create a contextualization, and I think there's not quite because because like for example what you usually what usually happens, like in in science what you do is you go and you knock on things you rub it and yeah, right. see see what it does when you kick it, right and there's not nothing in there that allows you to kick it right yeah that would be something I could add uh, I mean yeah that would be a fair addition too because as long as they're just sticking with the solutions found and analyzing those solutions, they're not proving to any more information than the algorithm has. Right. So yeah, and, and ideally what this would turn into is some kind of ecosystem like the Foldit uh, system, which has that, where people can develop uh, different algorithmic tools to jostle the solutions and explore different possibilities much more effectively than just visually looking at things. So that would be a future, a future thing that I want to head towards, yes. So I agree with that guy. Yes, sir. Could you go back to your first slide, please? Yeah. The outline? Um, keep going. Keep going. Very, very beginning. The God of the Gaps one? Yeah, okay. Keep going. Now increase it and just go through the slide because it's like the third slide in. Yeah, okay. Oh, yes. Stop, go back. Uh, okay. yes. At the very bottom, you've got underlined and large font, which I'm going to assume is an assertion. Yep. Only intelligent agents create information. Right. Are you sure you want to assert that? Uh, it's an ignoring hypothesis. I mean, it's, it's what undergirds my assumption that adding humans to the search process will actually provide a benefit. So it may, be, it may be broader than that, but it certainly can't be. I mean, other things might add in active information, but certainly algorithms cannot, and it seems humans can. Uh, could I suggest that, that that actually, that statement by itself is takes you down the road that becomes problematic? Well, it's actually I, crucial for everything I do. If it's crucial, it's even more problematic. I'll give you a perfect example. Only intelligent agents create information. Okay? Only intelligent agents create information. That cloud out there, see it right there? That was not created by a human agent, by a rational agent. Right, and it doesn't have any information. It has no information. Nope. It no, doesn't not in the context it has. No, it's all the process, it's all the product of deterministic or probabilistic forces, therefore it has no information whatsoever in terms of complex specific. In other words, in other words, every single droplet in that cloud has no way that I can uh, specify its position, its speed, the general viscosity. Yeah, you can it. specify those things, sure. Then that's information. No, it's not. Not by my definition. That I would care. Okay, that's precisely what I said. No, but that's precisely the key to what I'm doing here. Right. I'm suggesting that's a deeply problematic. No, it's not. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. One second. You, you have to understand what I'm doing here to validate uh, your I understand very well. Right now, you're about, just uh, going off the of semantics. You're yes. talking about computer information. Uh, no, it's a it's math mathematical definition, uh, kind of along the lines of what Winston was going for. Uh, in terms of the probability probability space of that particular event occurring, like it's a combination of disparate elements, that that combination itself is very improbable, and they also are specified in some way. So it's uh, computer information. Uh, you can characterize it in terms of bits, but it's not the same thing as bits on a computer. Any other questions? Uh, shut down, everyone. <laughs> Well, I mean, there was at one point you said that the uh, you're talking about the robot in the maze. Yes. You said the robot wouldn't be able to make its way out of the maze without human help. Okay. And, it, and only maybe it at that point. Uh, and I, I just thought it was interesting that you said that because the robot was only came into being because of human help. So what is the extension from that to any more help and just telling it to oh hug the left wall and get out of there eventually? How is, what's so hard about this? Problem? Right, uh, a maze is itself not a good example because there's a well-defined algorithm for finding its way out. But there are more, I mean, for example, if the maze had circular paths in it, then a uh, computer cannot solve it easily. In fact, it can become an empty complete problem. 
So, I mean, this particular maze I have right here is not an empty-complete problem, but if you just take away like one of those walls or something, it becomes an empty-complete problem. And a, a computer, I would say, does need some kind of guidance to find its way out. Now, in reference to the general theme, yeah. uh, was it Dawkins who said that you can't, nothing can really create something more complex than itself? So wouldn't it make sense that we can't create algorithms more capable than we are? That is assuming that we're the same sort of thing as an algorithm. And also, um, we are different kinds of substances than uh, algorithms are. We are actually simpler than algorithms, what we are, which is kind of counterintuitive. Uh, yeah. But it's because we are a fundamentally different kind of causal agent. And this is actually very Thomistic, too. It goes along the lines of divine simplicity. And if you look how Aquinas defines uh, the nature of man, they have a simple soul. I beg to differ in the way that you're using it. As a formerly okay. trained Thomist, and as one who has worked specifically in intelligent design and, and the scientific connections to Thomism, um, you're actually quite off. You're equivocating. You're, you're doing some very deep equivocation. Potentially. Well, and the idea of simplicity, right? Simplicity, yeah. in one sense, is there aren't parts. Right, and there are. But that doesn't mean that there's a simplicity of uh, capacities or powers. Right, that, but that's a different kind of thing than complexity. Like, a power is different than complexity. Complexity, it has lots of different parts in a particular organization. Power can itself be a simple thing. And that's actually, so, that's why it has complex powers. No, the power of them, it's a different kind of thing than complexity. The, the, the results of the power may itself be complex. I think the point is that simplicity is being used in two different senses. Perhaps. Uh, I mean, we can talk about that more. You're online. literally equivocating. You're literally equivocating. Maybe. Um, well, we can, this is a much longer and more in-depth conversation, though. So if we don't have any more questions, we can move on to the next guy.